Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the Sediment Transport Specialist at HEC, and this is a regional sediment management video on best modeling practices for RSM applications. This is going to be a video that will introduce you to the dredging capabilities in the sediment transport model in HEC RAS, and then in future videos we'll look at some of the more advanced capabilities. But the basic idea here is that if you have a sediment transport mobile bed model in HEC RAS, sometimes you want to apply dredging to it. Sometimes you're not just interested in the natural processes of scour and deposition, but sometimes you have to add some anthropogenic processes as well. Sometimes what you're primarily interested in is dredging and how dredging impacts sediment processes. And often you want dredging to happen one or more times within the context of your model. So it's not appropriate to just set up your model for the post dredge and run forward. You're going to want to have dynamic dredging happening while you model. And so we are going to look at that. We're going to use one of the sample data sets that comes with HC RAS. If you open the default data sets that come with HC RAS and you go to sediment transport and you go to dredging example, this is the data set that we're going to deal with. Now, as with most example data sets in RAS, this is based on an actual setting, but has been modified to make the example simpler and easier to use. So it should not be used for research or any sorts of engineering applications. But this is a system that flows from a kind of natural channel into an urban center. And once it hits the urban center right around here, this crossing, you have a main train dredge channel where you can get ships up into you know, the rail yards and some of these mills and plants. And so the client was interested in, you know, is there a way that we can dredge this channel less frequently, or is there a way that we can optimize our dredging in order to reduce costs in maintaining this channel? And so the HEC RAS model um, is a older HEC RAS model because you know, the actual dredge channel portion of it portion of it is geo-referenced, but the upstream channel isn't. The upstream channel is, you know, just in the standard, you know, import from an older version. And the profile looks like this. You have the native channel coming in from here, and then you have the dredge channel, which is pretty significant. You know, the, we're looking at a 10 to 15 foot dredge clearance in this dredge channel. And so what we're primarily interested in is not the contribution from this channel coming in here. You know, the contribution comes from the watershed upstream. And so sediment dynamics at this kind of run-up channel are not particularly interesting to us. What we're really interested in is the deposition that's happening in this channel, the passability of this channel, and then the dredging event in this channel. All right, so what we did first is we just calibrated the flow load curve. We can talk about that in a different video. Calibrating this flow load curve meant we had some flow load data, we regressed it, but then we actually had to apply a Duan correction to it, which we cover in other videos. But what we ended up with was, but what we actually ended up with was a rating curve boundary condition where we have the flow load data here and we have a pretty consistent gradational breakdown. We looked to see if there was any sort of flow dependence in this gradational breakdown and there didn't seem to be. And so if you plot it, you know, it's mainly straight. There's a little bit of an, a bend in the curve in log space, but that is our calibrated flow load curve. And then if you look in here, you can kind of see what other features are available. This was pretty standard in the rest of RAS, but in 6.0, we added it to sediment transport. So you can see that we have some separate cover gradations. We'll talk about that. Non-veneer bed change, we're, we're going to allow um, sediment deposition outside of the move bed limits, and we'll talk about that. And then we also added Cronin Parthenides uh, parameters. The, uh, the idea here is that you know, we are mainly going to be transporting fines, silts, and clays, and so we want to do that with the Cronin Parthenides parameters. This is primarily going to use the Crone depositional model. Because of the backwater and the you know, deepening, you're not actually going to erode much in the channel, even in these fine grain classes, but you are going to deposit some of these fine grain classes. So we want to do that with a little bit more precision. We want to use the Crone model. And so that's kind of a very brief overview of the initial analysis. One of the things you'll see is these upstream cross sections are blue, and that is because I have set them as pass-through nodes. Why did we do that? Well, because these are those upstream cross sections in the natural channel, and we're really not interested in what's going on there. 
in the model, you'll actually get some scour there. It's hard to not get scour through there given the, uh, the hydraulics here. But we're not interested in that local scour. The contributions are coming from the flow load curve. And so I actually lock these channel nodes down in order to simplify my model to the actual modeling question of what's going to happen in the dredging channel. All right, so let's run this model. And so that took about a minute to run. And so if we close out of that and go look at the results, I'm going to open the new HDF5 viewer in version 6.0. And so if we look at the invert elevation and switch to profile, and then we skip down to the final, you can see both the initial and the final profile, you can see substantial deposition, particularly in the upstream part of the navigation channel. And if we switch from invert elevation to invert change, you can see that we're getting between, you know, one and 17 feet of deposition, which is increasing as you move farther up the channel. Now we could look at that actually in terms of the grain class contributions. If you go to volume bed change cumulative, now you can see total, which is the yellow bed change. And so we're depositing everywhere, but you can also see the relative contributions of the other material types, which can be helpful in understanding what is depositing where. Okay, so that's what the initial simulation looks like. And you'll see we ran from 96 to 97. One of the nice things about dredging models is that because a lot of times you have to pay for the dredging and you'll go out and get every year or every few years, you'll go out and get bathymetries before and after the dredging in order to pay for them, you generally have built-in calibration data because you can go and look at the final post-dredge geometry and then go get a before-dredge geometry from a year or a couple of years later if, and there's no dredging in there. You're just capturing the natural processes and that provides really excellent high detail calibration data. And so that's what we did right here. So we just calibrated to the period of deposition between dredges. Okay, but now what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to use that period to say, how, are, how is this going to respond to the dredge? And are there different dredge strategies that we can look at? In particular, this is going to look at over dredging on the upstream portion of the, the dredge channel in order to maybe not have to dredge as often. And so I'm going to start by opening the dredge plan. Now, you'll notice that we actually aren't changing any of the standard files. We're not going to change the geometry file. We're not going to change the quasi and steady flow file. We're not going to change the sediment data file. You might think that, that dredging should be in the sediment data file, but because dredging is a temporal event, be because it's an external thing that happens, almost like a dam breach that happens in time, it's not a physical process, it's actually a plan level event. You control dredging in the plan. And so you'll go to the plan options and you'll go to dredging events and you get this dredging editor that looks an awful lot like the old channel modification editor if you ever used that. And so there are a lot of tools here. We'll go into the details of them in another video. But this is a very basic you know, approach to dredging. We talk about dredging in RAS as dredge events because a lot of times you're going to want to dredge multiple times and maybe you're going to want to dredge in different portions of the channel at different times. So each time you're going to dredge in the model, that's a dredge event and you're going to create a dredge event and give it a start time. If you only give it a start time, it'll happen instantaneously. If that level of detail doesn't matter to you, that, that's a good way to go. But there is the possibility to give it an end time as well, and the model will try to spread the dredging out over the, the context of the model. That actually works better for mass dredging than elevation dredging. Uh, and so if you're going to do elevation dredging, which is what we're doing in this video, probably the start time is the way to go. So in this model, I actually had a polygon of dredging, and so I could go in and determine the left channel station and the right channel station at which dredging would happen at each cross section and then the dredge elevation for this event is always 540. The dredgers are supposed to get down to that 540 plane and so that's what we're going to do the model. We're just going to dredge down to 540. And so this is what we call prism dredging or, or elevation dredging. The idea is, is that we're going to go in and we're going to cut all of the material out down to a given elevation. 
we're just going to go in and just take a box of material out. And if there's nothing in that box, we won't take anything out. And there, if there's 8 million tons in that box, we'll take 8 million tons out. And it, it, we don't know anything about the mass a priori. We're going to go in and take out a area stencil, a volume stencil, and just remove all of that mass. What are we going to do with that mass? Well, we'll just take it out of the system unless you want to reintroduce it. And there are some other options for that that we'll deal with in the advanced stretching video. But for now, we're just going to go in, we're going to cut that prism, take that material out of the model. And so in this case, we're defining the left station, the right station, and the elevation. But that's pretty tedious. What you'll notice is there are actually a number of ways to define dredging. And so we're dealing with these, which are the elevation dredging models. You can have a left station, a right station, and elevation. Or if you know the center station and the width, you can go in and define it that way. You can find the center station, the width, and then the elevation. But then the third elevation model, which is what we're going to talk about in this video, is just a little bit simpler. Instead of going in and kind of defining those distances, let's say you that you know the basic width of dredging that's going to happen through your channel and you know the elevation. Well, what we'll do is if you give us a width, we will center it between the movable bed limits and and kind of do this geometry math for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new plan. I'm going to save the plan as and I'll call it dredge two and then i'm going to go into my dredging events and i'm going to clear them out okay so now this is what it would look like if you have nothing if if you're just running the calibrated data set and so now i'm going to go into my dredging events again and i am going to create a new dredge event and I'm going to call this the 1998 dredge. All right. And so the first thing that I absolutely need for my dredge event is a start time. And so I'll say that in July, because this is in the part of the world where you only really want to dredge in the summer, that's when my dredging will happen. Now, all of my dredging is going to happen right at this point. Um, for these elevation dredging models, I'd rather not use a dredge end date because that gets a little bit strange. Those are really appropriate for these mass dredge models. And so if you want to spread this dredging out over time, what we recommend is to put in multiple dredge events that dredge different cross sections at different times. It'll still happen instantaneously, but it will happen over the course of time. And then my dredging starts at cross section 35. And so here's cross section 35. And I don't want to go into this detail of left station, right station elevation. I actually, let's say I want to game different widths and just you know work on different sediment transport approaches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here and choose to define the width and the elevation. I'm going to go back down to cross section 35. And I'm going to say that the width is 180 feet and the elevation is going to be 540. And I actually want to do that for all of my cross sections down to 57. So in these older RAS editors, you can't just drag, you can copy and paste, but that's tedious. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to go and select everything from 34 to 57. And then I'm just going to say set. It'll bring up a box where you can go in and say, hey, I want to set all of those to 180. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do the same thing for my elevation. I'm going to set, I'm going to set that to 540 and I'm good to go. All right. Now there are these other tools. If you don't want to set it exactly the same, let's say you want to, you want to make it on a slope. There are these tools to project that onto a slope instead. All of those are a little bit more advanced and we'll deal with them in the future. What we have now is a very basic dredging event. So we're going to press OK, file, save, and we're going to compute. And what you'll notice is that January dredging event is going to happen kind of near the end of this transport. And so that also took a minute to run. And so now let's go look at those output. If we look at the invert elevation, 
you know, that has the same basic initial invert elevation. But now let's go turn on the final. And what you'll see, the red line is actually the final. In this region where we dredged, it went in and took out a bunch of material. And so if we go back in time, I'm going to zoom in here. You'll see that the dredge actually happened, but then there was enough time after the dredge that there was subsequent deposition inside. And one of the takeaways from this model is that you know doing this advanced dredging on the upstream end doesn't help a ton because most of the sediment settles out from suspension. And so you know, making a sediment trap at the upstream end of your channel is fine when most of the material is transporting by bed material load. But if most of the material is settling out in this kind of fine rain of suspension throughout your channel, then an upstream sediment trap isn't going to be particularly helpful. The other thing that is interesting to look at are the cross sections. And so I'm going to turn on the initial and final cross sections and we can go and look at one of these that was dredged. And so what you can see here is that the blue line is, is the initial cross section. The green line is after some deposition. We deposit some more. We deposit some more. And then the model comes in here and actually brings out this prism down to 540. And then it continues to deposit after that. And so if we were to look at, say, the time series, of the invert elevation you know the invert at this point increases and increases and increases and increases until we dredge instantaneously down to 540 and then we continue to deposit at approximately the same rate now one thing you want to be careful of is you want to make sure that your dredge prism is inside of your movable bed limits you know one of the reasons that we turned down the option to allow deposition outside the movable bed limits is to get away from any weird numerical artifacts with that but if your dredge limits end up outside of your movable bed limits, um, strange things can happen. All right, so all right, and then we have one output that is that is dredge specific, the cumulative dredge volume. You know, this is going to be the cumulative volume dredged at each cross section in time. And so here, if we just go look at the beginning and the final, because all of this happens at once, you can see the volume of the material that is removed from each cross section. And because we only have one dredging event, the time series of this won't be interesting, right? If we go turn on the time series, it's a step function because all of the dredge volume happens at once. But if you go in and have multiple dredge events, if you're running a 50 year simulation where there's dredging every year, you can go in and you'll see the you know, multiple step functions. Or if you have some sort of temporal mass dredge, you can see a more continuous function. But this is actually a really helpful output because we didn't know a priori how much volume we're going to remove. We just knew what we wanted our final volume to be. And so this is a way that you can use this model to you know, predict the, the volume or mass that you need to remove and the potential cost of your different alternatives. So that is a basic introduction to 1D dredge modeling and how to simulate dredging in a movable bed HEC RAS model and some of the ways you can think about you know, how that would help you develop regional sediment management alternatives and game alternatives in a really quick turnaround, very like computationally inexpensive settings so that you could choose your most promising alternative and then maybe go to a 2D sediment model and do something higher fidelity. This video was funded by the Regional Sediment Management Program, which has developed a lot of tools to look at regional sediment problems and will be producing more videos like this on some of the best modeling practices and how to use some of those tools.